It's time for health, your super informative turmeric latte charged ginseng powered antioxidant rich natural health podcast with a slice of lemon. And I'm your host, Greg Newson, naturopath, herbalist, nutritionist, and we're here today for the Vitality and Wellness Center. It's sponsored by Natrovital Health Supplements, 100% pure active ingredients, no binders, fillers, or additives. Experience the difference today. <music> G'day everybody and welcome to the latest episodes of Time for Health. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss constipation. What it is, the symptoms, the causes, the side effects, some simple at-home tests that you can do to see whether you are constipated and obviously what we can do naturally to treat constipation and make it a thing of the past. Now, some people might think, well, I don't have constipation. I go to the toilet most days. I might miss a day here and there, but generally I'm, I'm pretty regular. Well, you actually may be constipated. And I'll discuss that how to tell whether you are constipated a little later on in the podcast. But it's very important to go to the toilet every single day. Why? Well, we eat a lot of food, breakfast, lunch and dinner generally, plus snacks. That goes into the body, the nutrients are extracted and the waste is then put into the colon with the toxins that are secreted into the intestines through via the liver, so it cleanses the blood. All of that goes into the colon and then out of the body because it's toxic, it's poisonous and the body needs to eliminate it. So if it sits in the intestinal tract or it's slow passing through the intestinal tract, there's a very good chance that those uh, toxins can A, be reabsorbed, cause damage to the intestinal walls, damage or inhibit the proper functioning of our microbiome, our good bacteria, cause inflammation of the gut wall and contribute to intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome, which further worsens the absorption of toxins. So think about it. We eat breakfast, lunch and dinner. And if that food doesn't come out 24 hours later, it starts to build up within us. So if you go to the toilet four days and then you miss a day, you've got a backlog of poo, which is not a good thing. Trust me, it's not. So let's look at what constipation is. If a person has a reduced need or desire to go to the toilet, that can be classed as constipation. If the stools are dry and hard and difficult to pass, uh, that can be constipation. Or they're like rabbit poo, that that's, can indicate constipation. There's straining when you pass a bowel motion. You can sit on the toilet for you know, 10, 15 minutes and read the magazine and nothing's coming out. There's a pretty good chance that you're constipated because it's very hard to try to pass a, a bowel motion. You can pass a bowel motion but feel like you haven't fully emptied. That can also be a sign of constipation. And then along with that constipation, comes things like bloating, pain, cramps, uh, flatulence. So they're all associated with constipation. But generally, as a rule of thumb, if you haven't gone to the toilet every day, past a number two, past a poo, you're going to be constipated. You're going to have some degree of constipation. So what causes constipation? Well, it can vary from person to person. Now, when people come to see me in the clinic and they say, oh, Greg, I'm constipated, I'll go, okay, First thing I'll do is look at how much water they are drinking. And if there's if they are a glass or two a day, I'm going to go, well, go home, have two litres of water, come back and see me. And I come back and see me and they go, oh my God, I can go to the toilet. It's, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's not really a miracle. Let me explain. When we, um, when we eat our food, uh, it's, it's broken down by the stomach acid and the digestive enzymes and goes into the small intestines and all of the nutrients that the body wants is absorbed. What's left is uh, fibres and byproducts that the, the body hasn't absorbed and a whole heap of toxins, as I mentioned, from the liver. And it's called chyme. It's quite runny. It's quite liquidy. So the colon goes, okay, well, this is liquidy. What we need to do is we, re, we need to conserve water. So it will remove the water from the chyme, which will then form the stool. So if you're dehydrated, the body goes, oh, hang on a second, we don't have enough water. We need to absorb a whole heap. And it absorbs it to the point where the stool is, becomes this dry and hard, pebbly sort of mass that just gets stuck. It, it, it doesn't... It, there's no lubrication. So the water actually acts as lubrication to help the stool slide through the intestines. When you're dehydrated and all of that water's been reabsorbed, your body just, it just, poo just sits there. It doesn't move. Another common cause of constipation is lack of dietary fibre. 
Okay, so the fibre, there's two types of fibre, well there's three types of fibre, there's soluble fibre, insoluble fibre and prebiotic fibre. So soluble fibre is broken down and forms like a, a gel sort of substance, it acts as a bit of a lubricant but it also binds to substances such as estrogens and cholesterol and other toxins to help eliminate them from the body. The other type of fibre is insoluble fibre and that adds bulk to the stool, it's like a big broom, it just pushes through and cleans everything out in the colon. The third type of fibre is prebiotic fibres, and prebiotic fibres actually provide nourishment and food to the good bacteria within the gut. Now, these prebiotic fibres are broken down by bacteria. They, cause, uh, they create short-chain fatty acids, which helps strengthen the intestinal walls. Uh, the strengthening of the intestinal walls helps with muscle contraction, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it how's, how the stool moves through the intestines. Now, if you suffer from a condition called dysbiosis, which is an overgrowth of harmful organisms and not, and, and not enough of the good guys within the gut, that can cause constipation. So the prebiotic fibres help improve the health of the good guys. But if you've got an overgrowth of baddies, you need to obviously eliminate them because the harmful organisms, they can can reduce the intestinal muscle wall contractions. Now it's those contractions which cause peristalsis that helps the feces move through the intestines and out of the body. Another common cause of constipation is food allergies or food sensitivities and what happens with the allergies is an immunological response that sets off um, an increase of intestinal inflammation and nerve irritation and then this can cause a breakdown in the message from the colon to the colon muscles and to the brain to help move the feces through the intestines. Talking about moving, if you're not, your poo isn't either. So if when you move, it causes muscle contractions in the intestines, which that stimulates that peristalsis, which is moving of the feces through and out of the body. So movements such as walking, running, swimming, cycling, anything, jumping on a trampoline can all help strengthen the muscle contractions within the intestines, which, you know, get you moving in <laughs> more ways than one. Now, sometimes when people have got that urge to go to the toilet, they might be in a meeting or they might be driving in a car or they might be somewhere that's inappropriate, they might be in a shopping centre and don't want to go frequent a public toilet. But re resisting that urge to pass a stool over time weakens the, um, the stimulus from the brain to the intestines through the nerves which reduces your body or your brain's ability to tell you, hey, need to go to the toilet, and then the poo just sits there. It's got no stimulus to move things on. So if you resist the urge, <laughs> do that at your own peril. Another quite common cause of constipation is chronic or long-term stress. So what happens when your body is stressed out? It upregulates a part of the nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system shunts blood away and slows uh, from the digestive tract and slows down its function. So because, you know, when you're stressed, your, your body perceives that you're under attack. And so it increases the heart rate. It gets blood to the arms and the legs. So you're going to run away or you're going to fight your hearing and so your sound and is, 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 is all uh, enhanced but what that does is it body goes well I don't need the blood there at the digestive system at the moment we don't need that to be functioning properly we need to get the hell out of here or we're going to we need a fight we're going to have a fight so chronic stress now you might not actually have anyone coming at you with a lump of 4b2 but you might just have the stress of work the stress of family the stress of finance the stress of news the stress of bad things negative 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 that can impact your body's ability to keep calm and, and, and activate the other side of the nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system gets blood to the intestines and gets the digestive system functioning properly. Hence, most probably why in a lot of the European countries, siesta is a very common thing because they relax after eating, unlike us in Australia and some of the other Western countries, we eat on the run. Now, um, I digress there, as, as I have done in previous podcasts. So managing stress is very, very important. So something simple like just deep breathing when you're feeling stressed, filling up your lungs and just slowing everything down can also help improve um, your bowel motions or your ability to go to the toilet. Another cause of pregnant, uh, no, hang on, another cause of constipation is pregnancy. Now, 
in almost 50% of pregnancies, roughly, I don't know who's counted these, but anyway, someone has, there's constipation, there's some form of constipation. Now, what happens is that when, when a woman's pregnant, the progesterone levels, her progesterone levels rise quite dramatically, and that facilitates a healthy pregnancy, which is a good thing. It also makes the food stay around in the intestines longer. Now, that's good for mum and baby because they get more nourishment, but that can then cause a traffic jam of, of food and then faeces hanging around, um, which obviously can lead to constipation, as can the pressure of a, of a growing child and, and the uterus on the colon because they're all around the same area. That can re- reduce the, the, the movement of the faeces uh, going through the intestines as well. Another common cause of constipation is a nutritional supplement, in, and that is iron. Now, Generally, iron's not a bad thing, but there's this particular form of iron, and it's iron, it's, it's not iron, it's ferrous sulfate, and they can also be called ferrous fumate as well. That causes constipation. It is really poorly absorbed, and uh, it just binds everything up in the intestines. So if you're constipated and you're taking an iron supplement, take um, different types of iron. Take an iron citrate, an iron glycinate or diglycinate, or an iron chelate. Those are far better absorbed and um, less likely to cause constipation. And make sure it has some vitamin C with that because vitamin C enhances the absorption of iron. Now, there are specific health complaints that can uh, lead to constipation and are diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome. So people can go from um, constipation to diarrhea, uh, diverticulitis, which is holes that are uh, not holes that are little pockets that appear in the intestinal wall because the intestines have become weak, uh, generally because of a nutrient and fiber deficiency. Uh, colon cancer, as you can imagine, colon, uh, the, colon the, the cancer is growing in the colon, which will impede the, um, the movement of the feces through. Parkinson's disease, MS and strokes, which can paralyze different uh, nerves within the body, can all lead to constipation as well. Lastly, there are a few pharmaceutical medications that can lead to constipation. The first one is laxatives. Now you'll be going, hang on a second, I'm taking a laxative to go to the toilet. But what medical laxatives do is that they artificially stimulate or irritate the nerve line, the nerves of the colon. Now this can cause the, the muscles to contract because they're irritated. You can imagine when something's irritated, it's going to contract and help eliminate feces through, um, through the colon and out the body. But excessive amounts of laxatives or long-term use of laxatives can damage those nerves, which means that those nerves become weak, which then cause those intestinal muscles not to react to the irritation. So you then can take higher and higher doses uh, to keep the laxative working properly. But really what those pharmaceutical medications are doing are damaging the intestinal wall and they are not treating the cause of the constipation. Another class of pharmaceutical medication that can lead to constipation are the opioid analgesics, such as codeine or morphine. Now, they cause constipation by slowing down the bowel motions in the intestines, and they increase the water absorption through the intestines. Antacids that contain aluminium or calcium, such as um, aluminium hydroxide or calcium carbonate, can cause constipation because those substances have a binding effect on the stool, which then reduces the ability of the feces to move through the colon effectively. Another class of drugs that can cause constipation are the anticholinergic medications, um, and they can com- they include antihistamines, antipsychotics, uh, and these medications inhibit the function of acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is a major neurotransmitter, which is a brain chemical that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system, one of its roles is to contract smooth muscles, which is the muscles in the intestines. So if you inhibit the function of acetylcholine, you can slow down the, 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 the feces ability to pass through the colon effectively. A particular blood pressure medication called a calcium channel blocker, such as Norvas, Viropromil and Cardison, contribute to constipation by relaxing the smooth muscles of the intestines, which slows down the um, passing of feces through the colon.
antipsychotic medication that doesn't work on the acetylcholine neurotransmitter, uh, such as clozapine, actually cause constipation by blocking the dopamine receptors in the gut. Dopamine helps with um, a healthy bowel motion. Diuretics that are used to uh, treat high blood pressure and fluid retention can also lead to constipation because they are causing the body to excrete vast amounts of, of urine, which can then lead to dehydration. Certain antidepressants such as tricyclic antidepressants or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, can also have a constipation effect because those medications can also lead to slowing down of bowel motions. Now, there's a lot of things that can potentially cause constipation or lead to constipation. Now, I get, a, I get people come to see me in the clinic and, you know, they go to the toilet every two or three days and they don't think anything of it. They've got a whole heap of health problems, but they're not thinking anything of the constipation. They say, oh, look, I've been to the GP and, and he said, ah, there's no dramas with going to the toilet every two or three days. That's, that's, that's normal. And I just look at them and go, really? <laughs> yeah, that's not normal from where I'm sitting. So let me explain why. Now, if you've got, you don't go to the toilet, let's say you don't go to the toilet for three days, you've got uh, three meals a day, there's nine meals backed up in your body, plus snacks. Now, what happens is that that feces sits there in your colon, and it's toxic, it's poisonous, the body wants to get rid of it, it doesn't want it to hang around, but it's just sitting against the colon wall. Now, being toxic and being a cesspool of badness it will create inflammation. Now, the inf that inflammation can damage tissue. It can upset the balance of the good bacteria in the gut. So the more good bacteria, the more healthy the gut. The, but, but if it's a toxic cesspool in type of environment, that will kill the good guys and allow the breeding of more bad guys, which will further exacerbate inflammation. That exacerbation of inflammation can then break down what we call the tight gap junction proteins. So little bits of cement that are holding the cells together, just like a brick wall has, has, has all the cells are surrounded by mortar, or the cells, the bricks are surrounded by mortar. If you break away part of that mortar and it then allows flies and bees and wasps and ants and cockroaches and crickets and everything to pass through that hole, into the cavity of the wall. The same thing happens to the gut. That then allows undigested food, bacteria, bacteria byproducts, poisons, poo, to pass into the bloodstream. Once it goes into the bloodstream, A, it suppresses immune function, it can set off an immune, immunological reaction, and it goes straight into the portal vein, straight to the liver, and the liver goes, oh, you're not supposed to be here, we better get rid of you, and it dumps it back into the intestinal tract. And that cycle goes around and around and around. And eventually the liver goes, I've just got rid of you and you've come back again. This is not good. So we will do one of two things. We will put you into a fat cell and render you harmless. Now, the highest amounts of fat in the body is the brain. The biggest fatty organ in the body is the brain. So there's you know, memory loss, confusion, unable to remember things, poor concentration, poor focus, brain fog. So that's necessarily, not necessarily a good thing, which can lead to numerous sort of health conditions. The other thing the body will do is going, okay, we're not getting rid of toxins. Our biggest elimination organ isn't working properly. How can we get rid of toxins? It'll go, okay, I will we'll move them through the largest organ in the body, which is the skin. It's, the, it's one of the four detoxification or elimination organs, I should say. The skin, the bowels, the kidneys, and the lungs. They're the big four to eliminate toxins from the body. So if the bowel's not working properly, it's going to push it back out through the skin. Rashes, hives, boils, eczemas, dermatitis, um, slow healing wounds, all those type of things, seeping sort of wounds. Now, with this inflammation and this toxicity, this can lead to any single health condition you want, whether it be dementia all the way through to suppressed immune system and you get a cold or a flu or cancer. Now, I'm not saying constipation causes those things, but what the damage that the, 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 the feces, the toxins, the toxic buildup in the body can cause is anything. It can upset the autoimmune response. The 70% of the immune system lives in the gut, right? And that gut that controls the autoimmune response is, is, is in within the gut, as, as is the immune system that controls the allergenic response. There's more neurotransmitters or no, more neurotransmitter receptors in the gut than there is in the brain. 
90% of the body's stored serotonin or manufactured serotonin is in the gut. So low serotonin, depression, anxiety, panic, anger, crying. Let's, let's, let's focus on getting our cells pooping pretty much daily, okay? So let's look quickly look at some of the side effects that um, constipation can cause. And one of them is fecal compaction. Now, that occurs when the colon ain't opening or the rectum ain't opening and you keep on eating, all right? Basically, you're full of shite. Um, so that's not a good thing. That, you, you could have lots and lots and lots. You could have 12 meals just sitting inside you. Eh, it's not really what I'd call healthy. Now, this can then lead to fecal incompetence, incompetence or incontinence. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, that sounds scary, and pretty much it is. Basically, you leak from your bum. So you've got, you're, you're just standing around in the shopping center, and the next thing you know, it's leaking because you've, you're jam-packed full of it, and, and you're not getting that stimulus, hey, I've got to go, it just leaks out. So then that's incontinence, nappies, and those sort of things. So not necessarily a good thing. Now, with the poo not moving properly through there and being hard and dry, that can lead to hemorrhoids, and that's quite common in people that suffer from um, constipation, as is a rectal prolapse, which basically means that the rectum, instead of being inside the body, protrudes on the outside. Because of all the straining, you've pushed the rectum You've pushed it out, which is, well, I shouldn't be laughing, but it's not, it's, not a, it's not a nice thing. Now, constipation can also lead to headaches. Now, the reason why headaches occur is that toxic buildup, the toxic residue that's floating around your body, upsets the liver. Now, in Chinese medicine, um, one of the signs of poor liver function are headaches or migraines. So you can imagine the the liver, the, the body is talking to you. The, the, head, the head's not very happy because it's full of toxins and, and, and not nice things. But the liver goes, I'm struggling. I really can't do this job properly. It will talk to you. It'll give you a sign or a symptom. And one of those signs and symptoms is a headache. Sometimes people with constipation, they can just not feel hungry. They lose their appetite because they're chock-a-block. You know, and the body goes, you know, I don't need any more. I've I got to get rid of this before I get any more coming in. So you'll just get that inability to, or that desire, I should say, to want to eat. Now, constipation, as if you can think of with all this toxicity, can lead to bad breath. So you've got all this fecal build up in the body. Well, those gases can float back up through and unfortunately come out in your breath, which is not a nice thing for... Um, <laughs> not a nice thing for the person with the bad breath or the person smelling the bad breath. Weight gain can occur in constipation, and that, that happens for two reasons. Firstly, the, you, 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 you hop on the scales and, you, and you're full of poo. Well, you're going to weigh more. That's, that's, that's common sense. But the other way that you can cause weight is the toxins that are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream alter the thyroid function, which impedes the thermogenesis, which is fat burning. So your thyroid plays a major role with fat burning. But if you're constipated, that, the toxins really just... They just they go to the thyroid and they basically just beat the hell out of it. They punch it. It's punch drunk. It can't work properly, right? So that's where the liver plays a good role. The liver and the thyroid are great mates because the liver removes the toxins from the body and the thyroid can function properly. Anxiety and depression can also be caused by constipation. And the reason why is, as I've just mentioned, all the toxicity that goes on within the gut that's associated with uh, constipation can damage the neurotransmitter um, receptors. Now, a neurotransmitter receptor is a, 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 a part of the body that uptakes a neurotransmitter. And a neurotransmitter is a brain chemical. So it's something that regulates some function in the brain, but it also does things in other parts of the body as well. So the major one, one of the major ones in the gut is uh, the GABA neurotransmitter receptor. Now, low GABA levels, so if the body's not getting enough GABA, can lead to anxiety, panic, convulsions, worry, feeling overwhelmed, insomnia, racing mind, those type of things. Now, if um, in the gut there is entochromophon cells, and 90% and of the body's entochromophon cells lie in the intestinal tract and the respiratory tract, and their role is to manufacture and store serotonin. So low levels of... Ser so, if, so if they're damaged, I should say, that means that they cannot secrete effectively the serotonin into the bloodstream, which then can cause low levels of serotonin in the brain. Now... Go to the doctors and you get that treated, you get put on an antidepressant. Well, we know that antidepressants can lead to constipation, so it's a catch-22. Another health problem that can be exacerbated or caused by constipation is elevated cholesterol. Now, the, the, the liver plays a major role with cholesterol. It manufactures all of our cholesterol, most of our cholesterol. 
And um, when it goes and does its job throughout the body, it comes back to the liver and the liver goes, oh, okay, well, we're not needing you anymore. We've got enough. I'll dump you into the intestinal tract and you'll be then taken out of the body. And that you know, soluble fiber that I was mentioning earlier on, that soluble fiber binds to that cholesterol, renders it harmless and out of the body it goes. But if that f- uh, cholesterol sits there in the colon, it is reabsorbed. All right, because it's not being eliminated. So then that le- the liver's making cholesterol because it needs it, and then all this other bad cholesterol that's being uh, removed from the body is then being reabsorbed. So your cholesterol levels go up. Okay, how do I know if I'm constipated? I'm going to the toilet, but I'm going to the toilet every day. I, I must be fine. You possibly could be. There's a good chance you could be, but there is also a chance that you may not be. Okay, so well, that's all very confusing, Greg. Um, Look, the simple way I give patients to know whether they're constipated is it's it's a so simple test. It might be a bit gross for some, but you've got to do it. Uh, grab a cob of corn and eat it. So dinner tonight, eat a cob of corn. Then see how long it takes the corn to appear in the stool. Because generally most people don't chew corn up and you can see the remnant of the, remnants of the yellow in the stool. Now, if you see that corn within 24 hours, Ah, everything's hunky-dory, it's sweet, don't have to worry about it. But if two days, three days, four days, five days or longer pass and you haven't seen the corn, there's a pretty good chance that you're constipated. And hopefully it's no longer than five days. Now, even if you're going to the toilet every day and you don't see that um, that corn for three or four days, you're still constipated because you've got a backlog. It's taken four days to pass through your digestive tract. So we may have to look at some things that you can do to speed that up and, and, and move things along. So what can we do to help treat constipation naturally? When a patient comes to me in the clinic and they've got constipation or constipation is part of their um, health problem, the first thing I'll do is I'll get them to drink two litres of water a day. As I mentioned earlier on, it helps rehydrate the body so the body doesn't absorb excessive moisture or water from the stool, which then causes the constipation. Thankfully, Mother Nature knows best and she has some amazing herbs that can help stimulate peristalsis, which is stimulate the nerves to contract the muscles to promote the proper movement of the feces through the colon. They also help tone the colon. So when the colon is being damaged from the constipation or medication or or other things, it helps to regenerate, repair and revitalize the, the, the muscular and the nervous systems within the colon. And they also help the liver produce bile. Now bile is very, very important in constipation. What the the liver puts a lot of toxins into the bile to get rid of them out of the body, but bile itself is a natural laxative. So if your liver isn't producing effective amounts of bile or it's not being released effectively from the gallbladder, you can be constipated. So improving bile flow improves constipation. And this is where Mother Nature's medicine shines. The herbs that it abundantly gives us, they have been used by cultures for thousands and thousands of years to bring health and healing to the human body. Whereas pharmaceutical medication has only been here for around 100 years, they suppress a symptom. Now, that that might cause a relief of something, um, but their long-term effects have a negative impact on the body because they are not a nurturing, they're not a full food, they're not a nurturing substance to bring healing and health back. You need to be on these medications forever and a day, whereas herbs, you don't. Okay, that's enough ramblings of an insane old man. Well, I shouldn't call myself insane or old, should I? No. (laughs) No, I say young, well, middle-aged. Anyway, I digress. Now, For patients that are constipated, I will give them Natrovital on the move, which contains a combination of herbs that help stimulate the nerves in the the intestines, in the colon, to activate the muscles. So peristalsis, which is squeezing one part of the colon to move the feces through to another part, which compresses, and then another part, and then eventually out the backside. It also contains herbs that put the fire back into the digestive tract. Um, It helps stimulate bile flow, so that's the laxative component from the liver and it also has calmative herbs that soothe 
um, the smooth muscles within, with, or relax the smooth muscles within the colon, which could sound a little bit contradictory, but they, people with constipation can get this griping, terrible pain, abdominal pain, and those herbs help soothe those symptoms. So the herbs that I find really good are cascara, chamomile, dandelion, ginger rhubarb, Turkish rhubarb, and yellow dock. Now, those herbs have traditionally been used for centuries to help improve digestive function and improve the passage of the feces through the colon, so basically for constipation or um, impacted feces or not going to the toilet every day, irregular bowel motions. And the good thing is you don't need lots of it. I generally start off a patient with two and a half mil a day, and if that gets things moving, that's great. And we just keep that there until it brings tone and we can modify things and eventually we wean ourselves off it. Um, some people might need a little bit higher dose. They might need two and a half mil morning and night. I've had, you know, you can go up to five, you know, five mil three times a day, but I don't think I've ever done that with a patient. I don't need that much. So fibre is also very important to get the faeces passing through the colon. So where do you get fibre from? Yes, you can get it from a supplement, and I do use one. Um, but before we get anywhere near that, we need to increase our fruits and vegetables and our legumes and pulses and beans and nuts and seeds and whole grains because they're fibre-rich foods. Animal protein doesn't contain fibre, but fruits and vegetables and all the you know plant-based foods contain a good amount of fibre. Now, what also doesn't contain fibre is sugar and white flour products. Even though wheat, whole wheat will contain fibre, white wheat will contain none of it and it will just clog. You know, when you're at school and you mixed flour and water together, what did it make? Glue. <laughs> you don't need that in the intestines if you're, col if you're, if you're constipated. So if you're having that, I sometimes, and, and, and it's not enough, sometimes I will help bulk up the stool with patients and I'll give them Natrovital Intestinal Maintain that contains seven different types of fibre. It contains the insoluble fibres, soluble fibre and the prebiotic fibre. So it helps nourish the good guys as well. So talking about the good guys, probiotics or the, the good bacteria, they're, they're quite uh, very important. So you can try your um, fermented foods and sometimes that's not enough, especially when you're constipated and you will need some good probiotics. Now, I remember my grandmother <laughs> many, many years ago, she was constipated. She went to the doctors and no one could do anything with her, but it was causing her a bit of discomfort and embarrassment and, and, and um, you know, she wasn't too happy about it. So I said, look, Nan, I'll send you down some um, probiotics. So Sent her down the multi-back 10 and natural vital multi-back 10 and you know a couple of days after taking it she thought I walked on water. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> She's oh my goodness I've gone to the toilet and everything. She was so proud and that's for some people that's as simple as it, as it can be. It's just putting that balance back in the microfiber or the microfiber the microflora within the gut. So very important. Now if you have an you know you've got a lot of discomfort and toxicity within the gut. Sometimes you might need something a little bit more than the probiotics. Probiotics good, but if you've got an overgrowth of harmful organisms, you might need some antimicrobial, antibacterial type herbs. And I use Natrovital Intestinal Cleanse, which has got some pretty strong herbs in there to kill the bad guys. And while I'm doing that, I will use a Natrovital Multibac 10 and Natrovital Sacrobiotic, which are two specific probiotics that help improve the good guys while we're killing the bad guys. So it is important to look at dysbiosis as a um, contributing factor to not only constipation but to other health conditions as well. We're all warm-blooded animals or mammals and we can easily become infected or come in contact with a harmful organism which then can reside or take up residency in, in our gut, uh, whether it's your dog giving you a lick on the face or your shook hands with someone, put your finger in your mouth. You just don't know where you can get transmission and it's quite common. So giving yourself a, a regular worming, so to speak, that's what dysbiosis is, gets rid of the, the harmful parasites, worms, bacteria, fungi, uh, candida, amoebas, all those type of things that um, can make a big difference to your gut health and, and, and then obviously any other part of your body as well, but especially with uh, constipation. Something else that people may, they think, okay, I can do this, I can do that, and I can take these products and all that's good, and they're, they're great and they can help. But, you know, if you're sitting on your bum all day and you're not doing anything, you're not stimulating the muscles in the intestine. So you need to get out and exercise. Get 20 minutes, go for a 20-minute walk each day. That's going to make a big difference to toning and strengthening the, uh, the colon and the intestinal muscles. For some people, they have tried drinking more water and increasing their fibre and they've taken the probiotics and they've used some herbs to help try to stimulate bowel motions and it just doesn't cut the muscle. You just don't get there. Well, 
in times like that, or some people that have a lot of compacted feces, a lot of buildup of feces in the system, I would send patients to have colonic therapy, which helps flush excess feces from the colon, thus reducing the toxic load, the inflammation, and then that allows the intestines to function a lot better, the colon to function a lot better, and begin to work more effectively. Now we're very lucky here in the northern rivers of New South Wales. We have a, a wonderful girl called Dania Goulding who uh, has bottoms up colonics in Lismore and at times we use her to help flush away some of our more stubborn patients' problems. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an understanding of constipation, what causes it, the symptoms that are associated with it, you know, the side effects of long-term constipation and a bit of an idea on how to treat it. Because you've hung around and listened to me now for over half an hour, for which I really do appreciate it, so thank you, uh, any of the nutritional supplements that I've mentioned, whether it be the On The Move, Intestine Repair, the Probiotics, the Intestinal Cleanse, any of those products um, that you think you might want, use this discount code, C-O-N-T-0-0-1, and you'll get 15% off your first order. Simply just click on one of the links below to take you to the product page. Now here's the legal stuff. Anything I've spoken about today is purely educational and not meant to diagnose, cure, or treat a disease. Until next time, this is Greg. Live life and laugh loud. (laughs) 